Good evening, all. I'd like to call the um, City of Emeryville Planning Commission meeting uh, for August 24th, 2006. Okay. Charlie, can we have the roll, please? Uh, Commissioner Cardoza? Here. Commissioner Donaldson? Here. Commissioner Flores? Here. Commissioner Germain? Here. Commissioner Hoff? Here. Vice Chair Martin? Here. Chair Jeffrey? Here. All seven commissioners are present. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, the first item on our agenda this evening is a special orders of the day, and it is my pleasure to um, at this time, recognize uh, Commissioner Murray Kane and Commissioner Ed Troiding for their service and contributions to the Planning Commission and the City of Emeryville. So, with that, Commissioner Kane, please step forward. <laughs> <laughs> da, da, da. We have a resolution here. This is resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Emeryville expressing the Commission's sincere appreciation to Murray Kane for six years of service on the Emeryville Planning Commission. Whereas, Murray Kane was nominated to the Planning Commission by Mayor Dick Cassis and appointed by the City Council on June 20, 2000 for a three-year term beginning on July 1, 2000. And whereas, Murray served two terms as a planning commissioner, his second term ending on June 30th, 2006, for a total tenure of six years on the commission, and whereas Murray served as vice chair of the commission from September 2001 to June 2002, and as chair of the commission from June 2002 to June 2003, and Whereas, if Murray hadn't retired from the commission, Frank Flores would still be a concerned citizen. And whereas Murray has put a sign on his de door declaring it the gateway to his home, and whereas Murray has on many occasions kept planning commission meetings from going on and on and on with his short and to the point comments, and whereas Murray was the elder statement on this commission, statesman, excuse me, on this commission, and a man of few words, but resolute to always second any motion to approve, mostly by Chris Owens, because moving this city forward was the right thing to do. And whereas every planning commission meeting tends to drag on at times, with certain individuals taking up more than their fair share of airtime, which was never the case with Murray. And whereas we will miss Murray's insight and good sense. Now, therefore be it resolved that the Planning Commission hereby expresses its sincere appreciation to Murray Kane for his six years of outstanding service, friendship, and compassion to the city of Emeryville and its citizens, and wishes Murray the best of luck in all of his future endeavors. Murray? Okay, Commissioner Ed Troiding, come on up here. <laughs> Resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of Emeryville expressing the Commission's sincere appreciation to Ed Troiding for six years of service on the Emeryville Planning Commission. Whereas Ed Troiding was nominated to the Emeryville Planning Commission by Mayor Dick Cassis, and appointed by the City Council on June 20, 2000, for a three-year term beginning on July 1, 2000. And whereas Ed served two terms as a Planning Commissioner, his second term ending on June 30, 2006, for a total tenure of six years on the Commission. 
And whereas Ed served as vice chair of the commission from June 2002 to June 2003, and as chair of the commission from June 2003 to, to June 2004, and whereas Ed served as one of the commission's representatives on the general plan update steering committee, and whereas if Ed hadn't retired from the commission, Frank Flores would be, be, a, be a concerned citizen. <laughs> And we're, couldn't you have been a little more original to say him on both? I thought it was going to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, wait till you're roasted. I know a lot uh, more about Murray now. Uh, okay. And uh, whereas, whereas Ed promptly deepened his voice when asked to speak lower, <laughs> and whereas Ed hasn't seen a residential project, he couldn't squeeze a few more three bedroom units into, and as a result, ensured greater access for Emeryville families. And whereas Ed always needed to spend a lot of time to let everybody know exactly how he felt about each project, even if other commissioners had already voiced the same point. <laughs> so the meetings tended to last longer when Ed had a point to make. And of course, the future families with, chi with, children, of Emory with children of Emeryville will always be thankful to Ed for insisting on three bedroom units and Whereas th there is nothing more important than fitting more three-bedroom units into every residential project as a foundation for Emeryville's future, even if they tend to be occupied by college students <laughs> packed in like sardines who park their extra vehicles on the street and make more noise for, uh, than they're supposed to, and at least for the next five to ten years when they will then be hunting for family housing of their own and may end up in the same very unit bearing, children's, bearing children in arm and making repeated requests to their neighbors to stop parking in my spot and please be quiet by 10 p.m. as my kid is sleeping. And whereas we will now need to designate a new champion of the three-bedroom unit. <laughs> you have a reputation, Mr. Troiding. Now, Thanks. therefore, be it resolved that the Planning Commission hereby expresses its sincere appreciation to Ed Troiding for his six years of outstanding service, friendship, and compassion to the city of Emeryville and its citizens, and wishes Ed the best of luck in all of his future endeavors. Thank you very much. really been an honor to to serve Emeryville over the last six years and uh, speak into the phone the, microphone please <laughs> not only on the Planning Commission but on the general plan update steering committee and still on the housing committee which I still am honored to be a member of so thank you thank, thank you Ed I would note there are also uh, cards well of well wishes from the Commission here on the podium for Ed and Murray Maybe we should get those Okay, moving on, the next item on the agenda is the swearing in of a new commissioner. Karen? I, Art Hoff, do solemnly affirm that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I, I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Cal California. That I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and that I will well <laughs> and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. And you can sign that name up here either. I'm swearing in Secretary of the Planning Commission. Thank you very much. You. Welcome. 
The next item on the agenda is the election of officers. Do I hear any nominations? I'd like to make a motion to nominate uh, Gail as vice chair and uh, Jim Martin as chair. And I think I'd like to make that one motion. I'll second that. Okay. Okay. There was a second. Would you, uh, Commissioner Hoff? Should we take a roll or is this by acclamation or how would you like to do this? I think it's by acclamation. No, you want to roll? <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's by acclamation. Any okay. objection? No. Okay. So that was moved by Commissioner Martin and seconded by Commissioner Cardoza? Moved by Commissioner Germain. I'm sorry, Germain. Germain. Thank you. And seconded by Commissioner Cardoza. Okay, Mr. Martin, <laughs> I am passing the gavel over to your capable hands and I'll change seats with you. Oh, okay. I'll move my glasses here so I can read. Um, the next item is citizens to be heard. Is there anyone attending tonight's meeting wishing to speak on an item that's not on the agenda? If so, please come up, state your name. Seeing no one, we'll move to the next agenda item, which is the action recap from the July 27th, 2006 meeting. Any comments on the meetings? Minutes? I did have, um, I had uh, one comment on page seven about the study session. I had three very specific comments as to suggestions on the Powell Street Bridge and they were improving the lighting on the ground level approach to the, the pedestrian way, redoing the bottom half of the stairs so that they were headed out towards the street rather than back to the abutment and looking at the possibility of raising, constructing a raised platform above the walkway to raise the pedestrians to Mm -hmm. visible street level and I just wanted those three comments to be in there because they were pretty specific. Any other comments? Okay. I actually had in the second paragraph under the same study session item, um, it reads that I suggested going with minor retrofit of Powell Street Bridge and I think the minor retrofit was something that I actually recommended against. Uh, my recommendation was to go simply with the major retrofit and if we could combine phase one and two together, that was my preference. So if oh. you could adjust that. So minor should be changed to major? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Any other comments on the minutes? Do I have a motion? I move to approve with the recommended changes. A second. So motion by... Um, Commissioner Jeffries and second by Donaldson without objection. I'm assuming Commissioners Germain and Hoff are abstained since they were yes. not here. So five ayes and two abstentions. The uh, next item on the agenda is the director's report. Charlie, do you have a Director's report. Yes, I do. First, uh, of course, I would like to welcome um, Art Hoff to the commission. Congratulations on your appointment and welcome to your first meeting. The City Council has met um, two times since your last meeting, August 1st and August 15th, and I'll give you a brief recap of what happened at those meetings. Uh, first, I want to note that at the August 1st meeting, um, the city manager, John Flores, announced that he was resigning as city manager, effective in November. I'm um, sure you've probably heard that, uh, but if you haven't, that's, uh, that was stated by him. And I just want to take this opportunity to, I know there will probably be other opportunities, but I just want to take this opportunity to briefly acknowledge Mr. Flores and all the fine work he's done for the city since he's been here since 1988. Um, <clears throat> he certainly uh, made a profound impact on my career. He, uh, had, he gave me the opportunity to prove myself as a planning director 
and uh, I'll always be grateful for that. Uh, of course, uh, he's, it was instrumental in the renaissance of Emeryville that's occurred in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, obviously, he didn't do it by himself. Uh, it was a team effort with a, a consistent vision from the city council and the planning commission and staff, but I think it's fair to say that without Mr. Flores' leadership, the uh, amazing changes that we've seen over the last uh, 18, 20 years would not have happened. So he, he's definitely going to be missed. And the uh, council will be doing a search, a nation, nationwide search for a new city manager, but he's going to be a tough act to follow. Um, let's see. Other things that the, uh, happened at the council meeting on August 1st, they held a study session on parking. Um, and that was continued to a joint meeting with the Planning Commission. The date of that meeting has now been confirmed for Thursday, September 14th. It will be here in the council chambers. It's going to start at 7.15 p.m. because there is a, I think it's a public art committee meeting. So there's some other meeting that's prior to it that will end about 7. So we'll be convening the joint meeting with the council at uh, 7.15 on the 14th. They also considered a sidewalk cafe ordinance. Uh, this item was pulled from the council agenda so that the commission would have an opportunity to weigh in on it, and that is on your agenda tonight. And then it will be going back to the council, uh, I think it's on September 19th. Um, they also considered a request for a reduction of the traffic impact fees for the Howdy Pup Doggy Daycare. And they did agree to reduce those fees if certain conditions are added to the use permit. That is also on your agenda tonight. Uh, they did approve a green short-term parking zone in front of the doggy daycare on the recommendation of the Transportation Committee. And they appointed Commissioner Donaldson to the General Plan Steering Committee uh, upon your recommendation, which she attended last Tuesday. Um, at the August 15th meeting, the Redevelopment Agency heard a status report on the Oak Walk project, which is moving ahead. Um, the, um, uh, the deal on, on the houses on 41st Street is in the process of being negotiated between uh, the Redevelopment Agency and the developer. Uh, they agreed to purchase, the Redevelopment Agency and City agreed to purchase the 50 public parking spaces from Pulte and the Glasshouse project. They also agreed to issue a request for proposals for the development of the triangular parcel at the southeast corner of 59th and Hollis. This is the, uh, where the forklift site and the other property is uh, across the Greenway from Elevation 22. They approved the first reading of an ordinance, uh, which the commission approved at your last meeting on compliance with federal, state, and local laws, a small amendment to the zoning ordinance. They also considered the ordinance that you um, recommended approval of at your last meeting concerning residential demolitions. They did direct staff to revise that ordinance so that uh, it would require city council approval of such demolitions. That will mean that the uh, most likely that the entire project, including the replacement project, would require council approval following a recommendation from the commission. And the revised ordinance will be going back to the council at their next meeting on September 5th. And certainly, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, after all these many years, they approved the Park Avenue District Plan. So that is now behind us and we're ready to implement it. Um, the implementation measures will be coming to you in the not too distant future. Um, the General Plan Update Steering Committee had their last meeting uh, day before yesterday. There was a presentation by the consultants, Diet and Bhatia, and a committee discussion on the future development scenarios. This discussion will be continued at their next meeting on September 26th, and um, the alternatives will then be presented at a public workshop, which will probably be in November. And after that, we'll be bringing uh, a preferred plan from those scenarios back to the uh, Planning Commission and City Council at a joint meeting. And finally, I just have a few announcements about some upcoming events. Uh, there will be a meeting concerning leaf blowers and a proposed leaf uh, ban on leaf blowers and what uh, feedback people may have about that next Wednesday, August 30th, and that will be at 5.30 p.m. here in the Council Chambers. There is a meeting scheduled in the Triangle neighborhood on traffic calming, and that will be on Saturday, September 16th, 
from 10 in the morning till noon. It will either be at the Recreation Center or the Senior Center. We don't know uh, which location at this point, but look for a, an announcement about that soon. The ethics training that Ms. Victor uh, previously mentioned to you at your last meeting has now been scheduled for 4 p.m. Uh, prior to the October Commission meeting, which is on Thursday, October 26th. So please mark your calendars for Thursday, October 26th at 4 p.m. here in this room. And I already mentioned the joint meeting on parking with the City Council that will be on Thursday, September 14th at 7.15 p.m. here. That's my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions of Charlie? Thanks, Charlie. Uh, the next item on the agenda are public hearings. We actually have three public hearings tonight, and um, we'll have a presentation from staff and then from an applicant if they choose to make a presentation. And then we'll hear from any interested public members. You have five minutes to comment. Um, the first item on the agenda is the Howdy Pup Dog Daycare at 1482 67th Street. Maru, I guess that's your project. Good evening, Commissioner. Uh, this is an amendment to a use permit for a dog, uh, doggy daycare uh, facility, which the Commission approved at the June 2006 meeting. Uh, it was a, a use permit to establish about a 9,600 square feet of dog daycare facility in an existing warehouse building because it's because it involved a change in use from warehouse to a dog daycare center it triggered traffic impact fees uh, the traffic impact fee ordinance allows uh, an applicant to protest the fees to the city council in this case the applicant did protest did file a protest to the council and the council heard that protest on on august 1st meeting at the time, at the council hearing, uh, the applicant uh, proposed two, uh, pro two measures which she, uh, she said that would uh, reduce the number of peak hour trips uh, that her facility would generate. First was provision of a free shuttle service uh, for 20 dogs, and uh, the second proposal was provision of significant discounts to uh, clients who would participate uh, in dog, uh, dog pool. The, commission, the council heard uh, the two proposals and directed, uh, directed that the use permit be referred back to the commission to incorporate the two proposals as conditions of approval and, uh, for, the re and, to, and for the staff to recalculate the fees, uh, fees as a result of the proposals and how they would reduce the no total number of peak hour trips. So that's what's in front of you today, uh, an amendment which says, uh, which basically, uh, incorporates the two proposals and these have been introduced in the conditions of approval and they've been underlined uh, to the, in the report. Uh, the building staff recalculated the traffic impact fees and the fees were reduced by about 40 percent. It comes now to a little over $13,400. Uh, with that, um, Staff uh, recommends approval for the amendment to the permit, and if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer it. Any questions? Um, I did the background to this page two of the staff report re references the two proposals, but they uh, they weren't they were presented orally to the council. They weren't attached to our staff report. Were the proposals written out? Or was it just in something that was presented It was orally? just proposals were written out in a piece of paper and uh, given to me by the applicant. Okay. So it, it doesn't say anything more than what the staff report says. Okay. Thanks, Maru. Would the applicant like to make a presentation to the commission? Can you state your name and? Good evening. I'm Crystal Parra, the owner of Howdy Pup. Um, I just want to say that um, we, we've definitely looked at several options for reducing the traffic impact and I'm well on my way to, um, to uh, procuring the shuttle bus that will, that will be able to have a capacity of 20 dogs and I think that, um, that that in conjunction with the carpool or doggy pool as we're gonna call it um, and the incentives that that will provide will definitely um, lead to the desired traffic impact as we've as we've stated so, so yeah. just for clarification are you looking at one bus that's going to take 20 dogs at a time or are you going to do back and forth 
van shuttle or? Um, I'm going to adjust it to the needs of the customers, um, but the bus will have a dog capacity of 20 dogs at one time. Um, they will be properly transported in, in kennels, two to a kennel, um, or in freestanding type of accommodations where they wear basically, I don't know if any of you guys have dogs, but they wear the equivalent of a, of a harness that is like a seat belt. Um, so they, they won't have much room to wiggle around and they'll be safely transported. Would the service be offered throughout the day or would it be morning and evening, so like drop off in the morning and pick up in, in the evening? Yeah, just during our, our designated pick up and drop off times, there's a, a period during the day where it's a quiet zone uh, for the dogs and we don't allow drop offs or pick ups unless there's an emergency pre-approved type of situation, but other than that, no. What's a dog pool? <laughs> it's the same as a carpool, but with dogs. <laughs> so if the one dogs take turns driving, <laughs> <laughs> no, but their parents the, do. <laughs> the dog parents, um, if they arrive with more than one dog in their vehicle, that's considered a dog. Oh, pool. they get a discount. Yes, they, they get a discount. What if they have two dogs at home? They would do that anyway. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, the, effectively, that's right. Um, and so basically, what it is is a multi-dog discount, but the dogs have to arrive together. Is this something you've done before? Is this a standard procedure with a <laughs> dog care facility? Um, I think that, that the shuttle service is not standard, standard procedure, but it is becoming something that is more popular. Um, this area, um, especially with the traffic on the 80 during uh, peak commute hours, which is when people would be dropping off or picking up, um, I think would be some a service that would be appreciated by customers. Um, Mostly the, uh, the standard um, is to actually charge for the shuttle service, but we will be providing it for free. And what would be the earliest that the shuttle would start? Uh, I know that there's a dog walker in my building and she shuttles around, picks up all the dogs, mm -hmm. and the complaint I've heard is that uh, the car parks and there's 10 dogs in the van and they're all barking their heads off for mm -hmm. five, 10 minutes while she runs in and gets another dog? Um, well, the idea is that we're not going to, um, well, I still have to figure out the specifics. Not having any customers right now, it's hard for me to say where I'm going to do the drop off and pick up. Um, but the idea would be that I'd have, um, the business is only open from 7 to 7, so it would probably start at 7 a.m. Um, where the they, we would either go to a specific location and ask owners to come and drop off at that location where it's already an acceptable location for dogs, like a dog park or, um, you know, the front lobby of, a, of a, an apartment complex or something where it's not, like, right in the <coughs> face of the, of, the, of the residents of that building. Um, I'm going to do my best not to have that situation happen. Um, another idea that's been tossed around is um, potentially uh, targeting some BART stations where we are encouraging people to take public transportation by allowing them to bring their dogs to the BART station, drop them off, and proceed to take public transportation, which is why I don't take public transportation, because my dog can't go on BART. <laughs> so the, the genesis of this is a one-time saving of about $9,000, is that right? Um, yeah, basically. And it, but it's going to cost you more than $9,000 just to provide this service, I would think. Well, it's going to cost me more than $9,000 to buy a shuttle, yes. <laughs> um, and operate it. And operate it, yeah. So, yeah, it is. But you think it's it necessary more. for your business to have the shuttle? Or yeah, I think that, um, well, not necessarily necessary, but um, it's something where if I'm going to be investing in my business, it's, it's something where I would want to invest in. Um, it would have been nice to do it later, but sooner is probably fine. Any other questions? No. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So with that, we'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone wishing to speak on this item? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Comments? I, I just have one question of staff. Uh, is there any precedence for this? For a recalculation of fees? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, not in my time. I don't know if the Charlie has seen something. Didn't we just mm -hmm. have a, a, we at least had an appeal to the fee for the there furniture was. Yeah, there store on 60. Oh, that wasn't six. on the traffic impact fee. I don't what? think was there it. There was, no, there was Chevron uh, gas station. The Chevron gas station. Uh, certainly there is a um, change, uh, whether we've had a precedent of changing the conditions of <laughs> approval to reduce the traffic demand, not precisely, but the, um, certainly the appeal process allows the applicant to demonstrate that their use won't generate that number of car trips and then the council can can make what conditions they'd like to make sure uh, that that's accurate and reduce the fee so is there any program to monitor the uh, this van that's going to be replacing the fees or uh well, not on, an on, not on an ongoing basis. We don't really have a mechanism for that. It would be compl uh, complaint-driven more than Typic typically, typically conditions of approval are complaint-driven. Right. No. Yeah. Well, yeah, I accept those that are tied to the issuance of a building permit or a certificate of occupancy. I think we would want to have proof that the van had been purchased before we gave a con certificate of occupancy, but. Other than that, it'll be an ongoing condition. Can we add that as a condition? What? That it's been purchased and sure, we can we can include that as I, I mean there is all, a I'd like to say I think this is a great use of traffic impact of eight thousand dollars in traffic impact fees. If this keeps ten or fifteen cars a day from coming into Emeryville, uh, I think it's a great use for those fees. <coughs> I think in in addition to the um, uh, the proof of, of the shuttle itself, um, I, I would like to to also have proof of a, a program, a transportation program, or how they're going to structure this pickup. And it appears right now the applicant hasn't worked out those details, and that could make a big difference in terms of how this program is operated. So I think we need uh, staff needs to see what the program would be. So essentially, um, in the first condition of approval, uh, let's see, I guess this would be Roman numeral one, capital A, little one, little A, and then four and five under that. Those are the two new conditions. After both of those, we would say we wanted, would want to see proof of purchase of the van and proof of the uh, development of the program prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy? Correct. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, I, I agree with Paul that it's a, a good use of funds if an applicant can find alternative ways of having drop off and pick up. But I know that at my building, 93 units, there's 42 dogs in that building and there's two dog walking services that run out of there and both of them shuttle these dogs around. There don't seem to be anything near the size of this facility but uh, probably half of those people walk or bark to work so if they had to put the dog in the car, head over to Howdy Pup or wherever and drop it off and come back, it would be, there'd be quite a bit more traffic on the road just from that one building so uh, it just seems like dog walking is kind of coming about. <laughs> New industry. New line of work. <laughs> so. Any other comments? <coughs> Do I have a motion? I move to approve. With the amendment? With the amendments as proposed. I'll second. Ready? Yes. On the motion to approve as amended, Commissioner Cardoza? Aye. Commissioner Donaldson? Aye. Commissioner Flores? Aye. Commissioner Germain? Aye. Commissioner Hoff? Aye. Commissioner Jeffrey? Aye. And Chair Martin? Aye. Seven ayes. The amendments are approved, and this decision is appealable to the City Council within 15 days. Congratulations. Uh, the next item, public hearing item, is uh, for the third unit application at 1051 45th Street. And Maru, I think that's yours again. Yeah. 
This is a use permit and design review to convert a uh, first floor of an existing single family house into uh, a separate dwelling unit. The commission heard this uh, item also at the June, uh, June meeting of this year and had several concerns regarding the, uh, regarding the work livability of the new unit as well as landscaping treatment, the size of windows. The applicant has made uh, several revisions uh, but before I go into them, I'll just do a quick uh, overview of what the proposal was. This is on the street. There are existing two single-family homes. Uh, the proposal is to create a living unit on the first floor. Right now, the ex there is an existing one-car garage, and uh, the rest of the area is used for laundry and storage purposes. This area is going to uh, the garage stays and the rest of the area uh, is going to be converted into a living unit. There is no change in footprint or height of the building. Uh, in terms of changes from uh, the last time we, you saw this, uh, this plan, they have made, um, they have changed the floor plan so that it is now one bedroom unit instead of two bedroom units. This has also reduced the, the parking requirement to just one additional parking space. And that space is going to be provided on the eastern side of the property, uh, which is right here. Um, in terms of other changes that uh, he has proposed are uh, enlargement of windows in the bedroom and the living room area, an additional window in the rear of the bedroom. Uh, he had earlier proposed relocation of the ex rear stair, um, relocation of the front stairs to the rear. Uh, that is not going to happen. The rare stairs, rare stairs are going to stay. However, he is changing the front stairs. Uh, earlier, he had proposed it to be steel and concrete. Now they're going to be uh, straight wood, made of wood stairs, which are right here or here. In terms of landscaping uh, improvements, there was a concern by the commission for showing um, uh, landscaping improvements in greater detail and for the entire site. Uh, what he is proposing to do is, first of all, uh, add shrubs and trees in the front area. Uh, one of the trees is going to go right here, creating a little landscape area to, between the two curb cuts. And the rear, most of the rear of the site is going to be covered with ground cover. Uh, as in the previous proposal, he's going to uh, replace the existing driveway, which is completely concrete, and replace that with wheel strips and landscaping. The new driveway is also going to consist of wheel strips and landscaping. Uh, with th those are basically essentially all the changes that are being proposed. Uh, and that's in terms of uh, you know, uh, use and density. Uh, the addition of the third unit in on the property is, uh, is within uh, what's prescribed for the RM zone. The zoning, uh, the parking requirements are also the additional one additional parking space for the new unit that is also in compliance with the parking requirements. Uh, with that, staff at this point is recommending approval for this project and if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Questions? I have one question. Did, did I hear in the rep read the report that they used to park a car in the back between the two buildings? This one right here, here. There was was there a parking? Sp yes, earlier on in the earlier version, uh, the proposal was for two bedroom unit. Uh, two bedroom unit requires two parking spaces. But however, uh, yeah. however, he has revised that to a one bedroom unit, right. and so that requires only one parking space. But I don't think they ever did park cars back there. Right. Oh, that, that was, was the my previous question. No. before the proposal. Right. That was never used as a parking space. That is correct. Right. Yeah. Is is it would it be desirable to provide tandem parking along this sideway because there's three units there and there's only two parking spaces provided. Uh, he's not required by code he's not uh, required to, do to do that, but uh, if he. I mean, if he wishes to provide additional parking, it is his, it is his free will to do or not to do. But right now, he's not proposing uh, more than one parking space. Is the seven-foot curb cut a, uh, a standard in Emeryville? Uh, it's not. It's smaller 
than what is in the code. However, uh, uh, from our point of view, there are going to be two driveways, and we don't want a larger, you know, half the lot as it is, it's going to be a large curb cut. Uh, seven feet is uh, acceptable with the traffic engineer, mm -hmm. and so that, you know, in terms of workability of parking the space, it would be adequate. I believe that curb cut that's dimensioned as seven feet on the plans is the existing curb cut. So that one is already there. Um, I don't see a dimension for the new curb cut. No, it appears to be the same scale. Yes, it does appear to be about the same size. I just wondered if that was the standard in Emeryville. I think the standard is 10. Okay. This doesn't cause a problem at seven feet then. Well, this was reviewed by the Development Coordinating Committee, and uh, they didn't seem to have a problem with it. Any other questions, Amira? Go ahead. Is the uh, replacement tree that's set back a little bit onto the property of equal size uh, to the one that was being removed on the uh, uh, curb? It's going to be 24-inch box, which is what we normally require for new trees. That's the standard. Is that tree uh, dying or disease, that one that's there now? The, the one that has been removed? No, that's not dying. It's been removed to accommodate the new uh, driveway. You have to go to driveway. Oh, yeah, now I see the curb cut. Well, I I'll ask, as a follow-up, I'll ask this of you, and perhaps the applicant can clarify if you can't. Um, why are they showing the tree on the property? Why aren't they showing it on the street, the replacement tree? My understanding is that they don't feel that there's enough space on the uh, on right the here but we can, we can clarify that f from the applicant yeah it seems that there would be enough space but I would defer to our landscape architect um, for that but um, it would obviously be preferable to replace it on street rather than setting it back from the curb yeah. I would note that under the city's urban forestry ordinance uh, street trees that are removed uh, need to be replaced with new street trees or a replacement fee that needs to be paid to the city. Uh, if the new tree is on private property, it would not be considered a new street tree. So in addition to planting this tree, they would also have to uh, compensate the city for the cost of, the, of a new street tree that wouldn't be put in. Yeah, that was going to be the end of my comment. Was that I'd rather nice have the tree on the street. I'd rather have the tree, too. <laughs> Any other questions of Maru? Uh, no more questions. Then uh, would the applicant like to make a presentation? Or the applicant's designer? My name is uh, Jamie Lopez. I'm the designer, the project designer. Thank you very much for uh, giving us the uh, opportunity again tonight to be here. I would like to thank also the, the planning department for uh, uh, recommending the approval of the project. I don't want to make another presentation, so I would be open for questions if there's any. Any questions of the applicant's representative? Why did you put the tree on the property and not <laughs> leave it on the street? <laughs> okay. Uh, one main reason is uh, the space, uh, if you look at the drawing, the space in between the, the two driveways, uh, it's a bit small you know, for, for the tree to be uh, planted back. So we thought of uh, putting it uh, inside the property. The tree doesn't necessarily <coughs> have to go back into one of those two planters. It could also become part of the canopy of the other existing tree along that uh, landscape or landscape buffer there. Well, he's going to have to reimburse the city right. to plant another tree. Yeah, we can we can anyway, also do that. So. Yeah. Sure. I just I, at least two two commission members feel that a tree over the money is uh, preferable. Any other questions of the applicant's designer? I have another question. Yes, ma'am. Um, concerning the, uh, <coughs> I really appreciate the, the, the your responsiveness to commissioner's comments at our at our last meeting, um, but I do have a question about the the stair in the front. Yes, ma'am. The building, um, it would be nicer, I think, and be more in character with the rest of the street, if you had solid risers, 
and solid treads. And then maybe the way I read the drawings now, the, the stair is open. If you could buy, you know, provide uh, walls on either side to sort of fill it in so that it's more in keeping with the historical um, architecture of the area, I think that would be preferable. Is, was there a reason why you left it open? Uh, if I may go back to my, uh, to my first uh, design, it's actually an open type uh, steel railing. Mm -hmm. But then when we, uh, I think when, when I got that comment during the last meeting that we need to do it uh, as, a, uh, as a wood type uh, staircase, I opted to do a closed wall railing. And then actually one of my, uh, uh, my option was presented to Ms. Miro at the time. So, uh, but uh, I think she, she made a comment on why, why not do it on an open type. Oh, okay, but so there was out of, from staff? Out of uh, wood, wood uh, balusters. Uh, did, did you you could sure. still put wood yeah. risers mm -hmm. on the stairway. It would still be a, a solid uh, uh, riser and uh, a tread, if I may uh, show this. Uh, okay, maybe I didn't read the drawing properly no, here. No, it doesn't show Something that. Something like this. <laughs> Uh huh. <coughs> this down. Did you want to make a comment about why? Yeah, I just wanted to make one. I'm Mrs. Collard. I'm, I'm the owner, and I just wanted to. My concern was uh, the safety of the, you know, the whoever is going to be living downstairs. If you open the door, nobody can see you. I mean, it's boxed up, and you're standing there. And here's a car in front of your, you know, door. And on the other side, it's all covered. I mean. I mean, I think safety should be considered in this case. I mean, I don't want to be living there if I'm boxed and I open the door and I can't see outside. Any other so questions? Well, it, if you had a solid riser, it would yeah. look a little more mm -hmm. substantial. Right. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe that's oh, but I think, the, I think the applicant's point is that you can actually see through the riser spacing and the treads with the open design, you can actually see from the street, you can see right. behind the stairway. But there's nothing behind the stairway. Right, but the, the person opening the door can then see out to whatever's yeah. on the well, no, street. No, because the door the isn't stairway. under the stairway, it's at the side of the stairway. Right. It's a setback, the door is set back. So set back. Actually, the way it is shown now, you will still have the, uh, the main door at the left side. So in, underneath the staircase is just facing a wall. So unlike uh, the this previous design I did, I have this, uh, I have a landing that turns to, towards the, the driveway. So that is actually blocking the, the doorway going to the, right. uh, the bottom part. This time it was done uh, in a straight plight, just like the, the existing, mm -hmm. but only out of uh, wood. Any other questions? before we open the public hearing. Um, thank you, we're gonna open the public hearing. Um, is there anyone wishing to speak <coughs> on this item? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Any other questions or comments Sorry. from the commission? I, I think it looks like a great design for, that's pretty close to my house and it looks really nice. I appreciate all the ample landscaping. Um, I, I have a couple of issues with the landscaping, and one is that what you've shown in the back and all around the house is just one s kind of ground cover that gets to be about six inches high, which means that there's really not going to be any usable outdoor space between the two houses. Is that, am I reading your plan correctly, that you're uh, suggesting Vinca all over? For the now, uh, I was uh, only uh, suggesting to have one, one type of a uh, ground cover. But then if the city calls for, you know, another type, you know, we could do it on the final drawing. If there is a need to, you know, to put uh, another species on that. Um, I think the issue is that if you use that ground cover all over the back, there's going to be no place where anybody can walk, sit, or do anything outside other than the little walkway that goes between the houses. And that's... And trip. Yeah. I mean, but Vinca is, is a vine. People can... It's fine as a border or but people are going to trip over it. It's supposed to be used for a gathering area. Uh, another issue is you have the parking 
at the side of the house, you've got a row of plants right where somebody's going to open their driver's door to try to get out, so that's not going to work very well. Need to relook at that. There needs to be some place where people can open the door and get out of their car. Um, I would also like to see that. I, I don't want to see the tree moved to the street. I want to see an additional tree put in the street right of way rather than, I don't want to see that tree taken out of your plan, but I do think there needs to be another one in the. So there would be uh, two trees, uh, all enough? New, new two trees? That's what I would suggest. And I, do, you know, I believe that the city's tree ordinance says that if you replace a tree with a smaller tree, you still have a fee for the difference in the value of the two trees. So we just want to make sure that what's being taken out is fairly replaced or compensated. So Thank they you. would have the same uh, size then? Uh, Optimally, yeah. The one I'm going to replace? Yeah. Optimally, you would replace it with the exact same size. Okay. Right, but that's it's too. They're not going to replace it I with an eight-inch diameter tree. I think the other option is that the replacement trees. If you take a tree out that's eight inches, if you replace it with two four-inch trees, you've exactly. also met mm -hmm. the condition oh. of exactly. the but, but they both have to be in the public right of way. Right. right. One of them can't be on your property. Right. It would really behoove you to read that ordinance. I think. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I think that point about the driveway and the driver getting out could probably be resolved by moving the driveway closer to the house. Closer uh, to? To the house? And then the passenger can't get yeah. out. Yeah. Well, there's 12 feet. No, there isn't because of the fireplace. Yeah. Right. It's 10 feet, so it's going to be difficult right. under any scenario. Right. You have something like uh, about 10 feet clear from the pens to the uh, to the base of the uh, fireplace. the chimney or the mm -hmm. fireplace. Well, maybe that's a, is there a fence there? No. Yeah, there is. But in in any in any version of this, you need to have some kind of walkable planted surface outside of the wheel strip, so that when people get out of their car, they don't trip, they don't have a liability okay. problem, and that they can get out and walk around. Yeah, we have a cement right right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can still put cement. So no, we, we want to see planting in between the wheel strips, yeah, but. but we'll yeah, in between, to he's going to do it. I think he has. Yeah, it. he has it. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. he said wheel strips, and but on the side, we can also have a walkway where you know the person who lives in the back can just use that walk walkway too. So what they're saying is this: to, to, oh, have you this have uh, it. to have this paved, okay. so as soon as they get out of the Any door. Any other question or uh, comments? Commissioner Donaldson, uh, could you uh, clarify what you wanted to see f uh, in terms of landscaping between the two houses? I, I think there needs to be a revised plan that shows either some kind of permeable area where people could walk s and sit or some kind of turf planting. Um, I notice the plan isn't showing any irrigation along the sides or the back either, so that needs to be looked at again. But. Um, it, it just should be usable space. Can we plant a grass instead of? Yeah, grass absolutely. Why don't we just do the grass? Right now, you know, we can leave the grass. Yeah. We can yeah. put the grass. In. Yeah, I think that's those fine. are. That's those better than what's being shown there. Right. Uh, I think that's detail that you work with the planning director on getting that final improvement of the landscape mm -hmm. plan. Yes. Um, any other comments? I guess the only comment I seeing no other comments. The co comment I or semi question but comment I had was the frontage uh, between the sidewalk and the curb says existing landscaping you don't intend to do any right now the plans show no landscaping in that area including the new curb area is that correct or do you intend yeah. to landscape there the strip there are a couple of bushes on the, on the left side well, there's a uh, rose can there's you speak into the microphone please other bush can you walk into the microphone there. there are roses on the left side and there's a there's a big bush which is rounded on around on one steps on the other side of there's a bush I mean if you want us to move those bushes we will that looks nice when you go upstairs and their bushes you know equal looking so the whole frontage the between front the sidewalk and the curb is well, already landscaped my point is there's is it possible to landscape the space between the sidewalk and the curb as well as part of your improvements yes. if there's any room yeah sure okay but this is the 
Are there any other comments before we have a motion? And do we need to actually make a, some revision to the conditions to identify an additional tree within the street right of way? Um, wouldn't hurt. Do you want to suggest where that language would be? Just a condition that they comply with the street with the tree ordinance. It is in there already. But they have options to achieve that. They could either pay a fee or they could actually provide an additional tree beyond what they're showing right now. And I think what I heard is a preference to have a, a tree. tree within the street right of way. Well, the way the condition is written right now, it says the applicant shall replace the tree in accordance with the urban forestry ordinance. Um, we could beef that it? language up and say replace the tree uh, with a new tree or trees in the public right-of-way. Then we don't want to lose this tree in the front yard either. Well, that's already in the plans, so you're, and the plans are referenced in the conditions. But they refer to it as a replacement tree. Oh, okay. You say in addition to the, in addition to any new trees on the property, there shall be replacement tree or trees in the right-of-way? If you, if you believe that they can plant enough trees to meet the intent of the ordinance within the right well of way. or pay or pay the required fee but I think we want to see at least one new tree in the right of way yes All right okay. with that clarification do we have a motion I move to approve second so motion by Commissioner Jeffrey and seconded by Jermaine and all the other comments on the landscaping are understood that yes. we will handle that at a staff level. And we are that? seeing this yes. with a front stair that has closed risers, is that correct? That's in the conditions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, ready? Yes. Commissioner Cardoza? Aye. Commissioner Flores? Aye. Commissioner Germain? Aye. Commissioner Hoff? Aye. Commissioner Jeffrey? Aye. Vice Chair Donaldson? Aye. Chair Martin? Aye. Seven ayes. The application is approved. Thank you. Good luck. Congratulations. Is to the City Council within 15 days. Much better design. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the last public hearing item is the sidewalk cafe ordinance. And uh, I'm going to do this. Okay. Um, I don't have any visual aids, so I'm just <laughs> going to stay here. You have before you a zoning, a proposed zoning ordinance amendment to establish sidewalk cafe regulations. Um, this amendment would add a new article to the zoning ordinance to uh, regulate sidewalk cafes in the public right of way. It would provide a permitting procedure uh, for sidewalk cafes. The permit would be issued by the planning director in consultation with the public works director, the building official, the fire marshal, and the police chief. I may refer the permit to the planning commission for your consideration. Um, it would be subject to standards and requirements regarding use, maintenance, and restoration of the sa sidewalk cafe area. The permit would be renewed annually, subject to a compliance review. Appeals of my decisions on a new permit would be appealable to the commission and your decision would be final. If I referred a permit to you for consideration for a new permit, then that would be appealable to the City Council. A sidewalk cafe would also be subject to suspension, revocation, or modification for any violation of the regulations or conditions. Uh, sidewalk cafes provide many benefits to the community and enhance the pedestrian experience. However, they may also pose some problems, if not um, carefully regulated, such as uh, unreasonable interference with the use of public spaces, hazards to persons and property, etc. Currently, we have seven uh, existing or proposed sidewalk cafes in the city, which are listed in the report. We also have approximately 20 projects currently in the pipeline, various stages of planning or construction that potentially could have sidewalk cafes. Those are also listed in the staff report. And there may be additional sidewalk cafes elsewhere in the city in the future in existing buildings um, or uh, new ones. In particular, 
I think uh, we envision sidewalk cafes along Park Avenue, San Pablo Avenue, Hollis Street, and in the Bayfront area between the railroad and freeway. The proposed ordinance was reviewed by the Development Coordinating Committee, and then a modified version was prepared by the city's Attor city attorney's office, and that was reviewed and approved by the Public Works Committee. The regulations that are before you tonight have been further revised in response to comments and concerns by the Planning and Building Department staff. The focus of all of these, uh, of these regulations and the various revisions that have occurred is to try to strike a balance between making the process as simple and straightforward as possible so that we can encourage the development of sidewalk cafes while still addressing uh, concerns about potential problems. So that's what we're trying to balance here. I'll uh, briefly go through some of the salient points of the proposed ordinance. Sidewalk cafes would be allowed in any zoning district in which eating and drinking establishments are permitted or conditionally permitted. Eating and drinking establishments as defined in the zoning ordinance include cafes, restaurants, coffee shops, and other such food service businesses. An application for a sidewalk cafe would be submitted to the Director of Planning and Building and it would include a site plan, specifications for the furniture and fixtures, photographs of the existing sidewalk and eating and drinking establishment, proof of liability insurance, a statement uh, agreeing to defend and indemnify the city and the redevelopment agency, and the payment of the requisite fee. I would then make a decision um, on the permit in consultation with the Director of Public Works, the building official, the fire marshal, and the police chief, and my decision could be appealed to the commission. Um, as I said before, the, I may refer a decision to you, in which case your decision could be appealed to the city council. Sidewalk cafes would be subject to a number of standards. I would like to note that on the dais in front of you, you have a sheet which is an addendum to this report. It modifies the proposed standards. It adds one concerning smoking, which is underlined. The uh, proposed standards uh, would include that the permit would have to be posted. The hours of operation uh, would be limited to the same hours or shorter hours as the associated uh, restaurant or cafe. There could be no food preparation or storage of food in the sidewalk cafe area. The furniture and equipment would have to be confined to the sidewalk cafe area and removed at the end of each day. Uh, at least four feet of clear sidewalk width would be required uh, and it could, that's a bare minimum. It may be the city uh, at our discretion may require a greater clear sidewalk width in certain situations such as along uh, Park Avenue or San Pablo Avenue where there are wider sidewalks. The sidewalk cafe would have to be maintained in a clean, sanitary, and attractive condition. Litter would uh, need to be removed at the end of each business day within, a thou within 100 feet, uh, including out to the gutter. Live music and other performances, amplified sound and dancing would be prohibited in the sidewalk cafe area. And the uh, new addition is that smoking would be prohibited in the cafe, in the sidewalk cafe and within 25 feet of entrances, windows, and vents of the associated restaurant. And finally, no changes to the sidewalk cafe would be allowed without my prior approval. In addition, if alcoholic beverages are served in the sidewalk cafe, it would be subject to uh, additional regulations. These would include that all relevant federal, state, and local laws and zoning regulations would have to be complied with. A valid license from the ABC would be required. Uh, there would have to be a substantial physical barrier between the cafe and the uh, rest of the sidewalk. Patrons would not be allowed to leave the sidewalk cafe with alcohol or to sell or give alcohol to people outside the sidewalk cafe area. And the sidewalk cafe would be required to maintain full, full food service at all times and, not, and never operate as a bar or a tavern or a cocktail lounge. The renewal procedure, uh, the annual renewal procedure is, is modeled after that for business licenses and it would run concurrently. The permit would expire on December 31st of each year, uh, and an application for renewal would need to be submitted. We try to make this process as simple as possible. They would simply return a form to us indicating whether any uh, information in the original application had changed, an updated uh, liability insurance 
uh, certificate for the coming year and payment of the renewal fee. Uh, staff would then review this renewal application in consultation again with Public Works, the building official, the fire marshal, and the police chief to make sure that the sidewalk cafe was still complying with all of their conditions and standards and to investigate any complaints. If there were no problems, we would renew the permit and send them a new, a new certificate for posting. If for some reason uh, we should decide not to renew the permit, we would provide a detailed explanation to the applicant as to why it wasn't renewed. And in either case, the, uh, my decision on renewal would be appealable to the commission. Um, if for some reason either I or the commission decides not to renew a permit, then the sidewalk cafe would have to be removed within 30 days and the sidewalk restored. Also, the payment of the fee would be considered delinquent after March 1st, and if the uh, renewal application and fee was not received by March 1st, the permit would be considered to be expired and a, a new permit would have to be sought, meaning that the new permit process would have to um, be gone through again. Uh, sidewalk FA permits could also be revoked, suspended, revoked, or modified uh, by me for any violation of the regulations or conditions, and my decision on that would be appealable to the Commission. If a sidewalk cafe ceases to operate for any reason, then the sidewalk would need to be returned to its original condition to the satisfaction of the Public Works Director at the permittee's expense. There are no fees established for this at the present time. That will require a change to the master fee schedule, but we envision these fees would be nominal in the range of $100 to $200 for the original permit and somewhere between $25 and $100 for the annual renewal fee. Existing sidewalk cafes uh, that are already there prior to the enactment of this ordinance would need to be brought into conformance within six months, meaning they'd have to submit an application and get it approved. And um, this amendment would not apply to outdoor seating for adjacent restaurants in city parks or along the Greenway. However, we are working on an ordinance to regulate access to private property from the Greenway and city parks, and that ordinance would include provisions to regulate outdoor seating, which we expect to be substantially similar to this sidewalk cafe ordinance. We'll be bringing that ordinance to you in the near future. Um, and with that, we recommend that the Commission vote to recommend City Council adoption of this ordinance to establish sidewalk cafe regulations. I know that the Chamber of Commerce has had some comments on this. I don't know if anyone's here from the Chamber. I've exchanged some uh, messages with Bob Cantor of the Chamber. Uh, he had concerns about a couple of things I'd just like to tell you about. Um, I'm certainly not going to advocate for or against his position at this point, but I just want to let you know what his concerns were. Um, they were that uh, the 100 feet cleanup he felt was a little excessive and pointed out that that could extend all the way across to the other side of the street. It was not staff's intent to include the other side of the street. It was only intended to include the same side of the street within 100 feet. He felt that should be reduced to 25 or 50 feet. Um, he also had concerns about the um, music. He um, suggested that um, perhaps not live music and dancing, but some kind of um, music piped in through loudspeakers or whatever might be a nice addition to sidewalk cafes and add to the ambience of the street. We have concerns that that would be difficult to regulate, um, and so our proposal is just to prohibit it. Um, again, he's not here to advocate for that position, so I can't really tell you what, what that would entail. I believe those were his main concerns. He also had a concern about the fees, but when he then saw our proposal that the fees would be nominal, he said that was fine and that's what they would hope for. Um, I should also point out that we did send a copy of this staff report to the seven existing or proposed sidewalk cafes that are listed in the report. It looks like none of them have showed up here tonight, though. So um, that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to respond to any questions you, you may have. Thanks, Charlie. Any questions for Charlie? I have one question, and it pertains to uh, page 5 of the staff report under the second paragraph uh, where it states, while well, administrative procedures are not spelled out in the zoning ordinance amendment, it is envisioned that the finance department would send out renewal notices for sidewalk cafes, et cetera, et cetera. I guess my question there is, is this going to 
create any problems or uncertainty or gray areas by not having something spelled out in the zoning ordinance? I don't think we want to get that detailed. The, um, as I say, it's modeled after the business license procedure and that section of the municipal code does not spell out the administrative procedures for how business licenses are processed. Okay. It only says, you know, what you have to pay and when you have to pay it. Uh, I guess a concern would be if we s spell out administrative procedures in the zoning ordinance, then we couldn't change the administrative procedures without going back to the city council, um, which I think is a, a bit more than we want to have in the zoning ordinance. We did intend to try to make this as painless as possible, both for staff and for the mm -hmm. Sidewalk Cafe owners, and by linking it to the uh, not linking it exactly, but piggybacking it on the existing business license procedure, we figured that's a way that we can remember to send out the renewal notices every year and get the applications for renewal back to staff. However, I would point out as it says in that paragraph and as it also says in the procedures about business licenses, the city is under no obligation to send out reminder notices. And just because we have failed to do so does not relieve the owners of the sidewalk cafes from the obligation to renew their permits. Thank you, Charlie. Any other questions? Yeah, um, it was my concern about the uh, live music and I could see that live music could add to the ambiance on the street. And I just want to make sure that that live music prohibition, it says shall be prohibited in the sidewalk cafe. Does that mean that in the whole cafe you can't have no, only in the sidewalk cafe. The cafe, if, the sidewalk if, cafe area, right, is what you're referring. If to. the associated eating and drinking establishment had a cabaret permit, they could certainly have live music inside. But it, then could we add on that in the sidewalk cafe area or the outside area instead of? Uh, it, it seems to prohibit anything in the cafe from having live or amplified music. They've got a definition under on, um, item F on the previous. Uh, in the resolution that defines sidewalk cafe? Okay. Yeah, sidewalk, that's right. Sidewalk okay. cafe is defined as the it outdoor area. I had, had one more, and that's on, uh, the, it's actually the next one. No changes to the layout, design, or operation of the sidewalk cafe shall be allowed, yada, yada. Um, th those, those people tend to rearrange the furniture fairly often out on those sidewalks, one. And then I don't see any proviso for submitting a plan for those tables. I, I'm not asking for a plan, but right here it says you can't move them without, you can't change the layout without your approval, mm -hmm. but there's no layout to be provided. Oh, yes, there is. Well, uh, no, uh, there's specifications. Under permit application. No, under permit application, uh, if you look at the resolution, page. Uh, site plan and specifications. Well, yeah, a site plan, dimensioned yeah. clearly and labeled. Uh, site plan shall clearly indicate the number and arrangement of tables and chairs and any other proposed features, including but not limited to umbrellas, heaters, trash containers, railings, planters, and fencing. Oh. <laughs> now, you know, I mean, we, wanna, we don't want to become control police, control freaks here. Right. If well, they move their tables around, I don't think yeah, we're going to. Yeah, that's gonna, what I was hoping, it, that it, this would not yeah. make them... Uh, in non-compliance by moving a few tables. We want to make sure we have the ability right. to make to to approve any changes. So if we walk down the street one day and discover the sidewalk cafe has been moved to a completely different part of the frontage than it was before, we can say, wait a minute. Yeah. Well, I guess the biggest problem would be expanding into the four-foot pedestrian right away. Yes, that would definitely be a concern. Yeah. I might note that this is similar to the kinds of conditions we have for any use permit or design review application. Technically, they're not supposed to change anything from what you have approved, you know, without my approval. And it could be some small little thing. You know, sometimes they change stuff and we don't say anything about it. And other times, if it's a bigger thing, we might want to look at it. But it just gives us a mechanism to make sure we keep our eyes on it. Any other questions? I've actually got a couple under standards on page four. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Six. Are you in the staff report or the ordinance? I'm uh, in the uh, staff yes. report. Okay. Uh, it's also in the uh, conditions of the ordinance. Um, you specify that the 
cafe and adjacent sidewalks shall be swept weekly and any food operation sweeps at least once yeah, a day yeah. um, whether it's inside or outside it just seems I'm not sure where you got the weekly standard I got it from the ABC this the State Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control has a standard that if uh, alcohol is served outside it's the area is supposed to be swept okay. weekly I just like to see that swept daily I mean it's just part of operation we and can I change it that would be complaint driven if somebody's make leaving a mess outside you know the city has the authority to step in and make sure they're cleaning sufficiently um, back to the um, to Bob's comment about the hundred foot distance I am going to ask you what you think is appropriate um, I don't mind specifying a distance and it seems like it's in the interest of the cafe to have you know 50 or 100 feet cleaned up as well did there's it, there's no, the 100 foot it's somewhat I mean it's a round number okay. you know it's somewhat arbitrary uh, we wanted it to be on the same block clearly and encompassing at least an adjacent storefront um, 100 feet would probably encompass two or three storefronts, maybe even four storefronts, depending on how wide they are. Um, so a, a lesser distance, I think, would not be unreasonable. Okay. For uh, some of the commercial use, especially the fast food, there's been some discussion about problems with trash around them. Is right. there anything specific in our zoning ordinance around pickup, especially for that type of commercial use not for the use itself right now? Not currently. Okay. Um, that's it for my questions. So did you want to change that 100 foot? Well, we need to open the public Standard. hearing. Okay, okay. We'll yes, you're right. Uh, any other questions? Um, I, I have a couple of questions. I was wondering, in your definitions, looking at the sidewalk cafe, um, was there any discussion about the possibility of using the parking zone in certain circumstances where there might be a narrow sidewalk and there might be bulb outs and there might be a protected area that the parking zone could be used for cafe space? This would not preclude that. No? I don't. Well, you have the word adjacent to, but I think we would interpret that to mean, you know, the entire sidewalk between the curb and the building. So it could... You know, as long as they provide a site plan that I, public works, building official, fire, police, all feel is workable, it could include the area immediately adjacent to the street. Right. I mean the parking area. Some, some Oh, in the street itself? Yeah, some jurisdictions have a flexible zone on certain oh. streets where they allow uses under circum certain circumstances, obviously with some kind of protection for pedestrians. That would there. not be allowed by this ordinance. That, right. that was, and I was sidewalk. just wondering if there was discussion yeah. about that. Uh, no, actually that hasn't come up. There's a restaurant in San Francisco. They close off the whole street there. What's that? Well, one? we could do that too. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. I saw a uh, sidewalk cafe recently in Halifax, Nova Scotia, where they had appropriated the entire sidewalk and uh, the pedestrians had to walk out in the street. Ah. Around it. <laughs> well, this would be sort of that would this would this would be I'm the reverse of that. The flip side of yeah. that that you would keep the sidewalk clear for pedestrians, but be able to encroach on the parking zone. I understand. Under certain circumstances. Um, we have no that idea has not been brought up before. Well, that could be done with a special permit on a special occasion. Well, that, that is the public right of way, and this does with the, with the right plan that probably would not be precluded. Right? Well, no, this, this says the sidewalk cafe is on the sidewalk, and then oh. it defines sidewalk. So it does well. not include the street. Well. And I also had a question about the removal of the sidewalk cafe furnishings at, at the end of every business day. And I'm wondering if someone has put out some attractive planters to define their cafe space. Would they have to roll in planters every day, or would they, is it just talking about tables and chairs? Well, I think the, uh, the planter, the, the, the barrier around the sidewalk cafe would be required to be removed every day. But if they were planters on rollers, they think they could be rolled up against the face of the building and left outside. They're subject to being stolen. <laughs> right. Those were my only questions. Um, 
Michelle de Guzman from the Economic Development and Housing Department was um, quite involved in the development of this ordinance and she has a few thoughts she'd like to share. Okay, sorry I've been whispering to Charlie. <laughs> um, the first thing that I wanted to address uh, was your concern about using the parking area mm -hmm. for, uh, for sidewalk seating. Actually the wording of the ordinance to ensure that the uh, sidewalk seating is adjacent to the restaurant is actually meant to preclude the use of both the parking area or um, to put the seating adjacent to the street but allow, uh, it's sort of hard to visualize without, uh, without some sort of, but you know, to allow the seating next to the street and a gap of the public right of way and then the restaurant, which is actually fairly common in, I believe it's Mountain View. Mm -hmm. um, that's, and they actually had the same thing where they allow some of the parking area to be flexible for that use. But um, that, was a, that was a little bit more significant in terms of the effects of that. So we wanted to keep it much more simple to just put it adjacent to the, uh, to the sidewalk cafe. And that was, that was also at the request of the city attorney because they felt there was too much liability to have the sidewalk patrons that close to the street. But didn't, for the Park Avenue plan that we just adopted, doesn't that include an option between the sidewalk and the curb and the planting areas to have no. deliberately, to, no, that yeah. didn't get approved? Yeah. Well, that, that well, was n that was never proposed. That was not in the I'm plan. The, there's, a, schematics there's, an, there's a so-called encroachment zone of four feet, which is between the building and the sidewalk. And that's the area where sidewalk cafes could be located. Oh. I thought there was the also an option to include There are four foot by six foot modular uh, panel kind of areas in the sidewalk out by the curb and those are either to be planted with street trees or some other kind of planting or filled in with brick pavers which would be like seating areas uh, but not I'm mean like benches on the street but not, not sidewalk not cafes. Tables. Okay. That was never envisioned as part of the Park Avenue plan. Okay. Yeah, and what Charlie just described for the sidewalk seating on Park Avenue is in congruence with this ordinance as well in terms of the location of the seating. Um, and then the second item was um, the planters and actually the, uh, rather if planters were being used as barriers. And um, the way the ordinance is envisioned is that uh, the applicants will have an opportunity to have both removable barriers mm -hmm. as well as barriers that may be essentially semi-permanent if they wanted to set something in the sidewalk uh, just for the, to define the area. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of the reason for that is a removable fence, if you bring it in and out every day, can get sort of, if it's painted metal, it could get chipped and damaged with the, the constant uh, back and forth. So it's to help preserve that. Uh, that appearance, but the tables and chairs and anything that would not be affixed to the sidewalk would need to be removed on a daily basis. Okay. We need to modify these standards then okay. because the way it's written now it says all furniture and equipment. So we can, Unless I mean, permanently approved. Yeah, or semi-permanent or barriers or whatever <laughs> can like remain that. where they are. A lot of us worked on this ordinance. Yeah. So <laughs> that's why we're not all clear what's it. Thanks, Michelle. Right, thank Any you. other questions? For that, we'll open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on this item? Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. <coughs> Comments? I think it's a great idea. And I Absolutely. This is definitely going to enliven the streets of Emeryville. And I think it's a great opportunity for many businesses to expand their, their ability to serve yep. patrons generate more tax revenue for the city as well. Yeah, I'd just like to see that change to um, the permit standards under section 9-4.6-5 uh, item H that sweeping be um, performed daily rather than weekly. I just think it's important that when you're serving food you clean up every day. So Did you want to modify that 100 foot distance? I, I don't have a problem with 100 foot because if there's a trash, you know, again, it's a complaint issue. We should probably clarify that it's on the same side of the street. Uh, you want to make it 20 feet or 10 feet into the street so it takes care of the curb? We didn't or want the, them to be required right. to go out into mm -hmm. the traffic right. area. Yeah. 
That so seems just to the curb. Right. Stuff gets thrown in the curb. I'm not They'd have, they would have to, it includes the gutter. Okay. They'd have to pick up stuff in the gutter, but not out in makes the street sense. itself. Mm -hmm. I think that makes sense. So uh, somehow we'll reword this to say on the same side of the street. Any other suggested revisions? And you're going to clarify the language about possibility of permanent uh, fixtures. Yeah, that, that semi-permanent barriers uh, may be may remain. Excellent point. Uh, the other the com I know Starbucks has amplified or they have the sound pumped out of every one of their locations right now. So in compliant mm -hmm. in meeting the co six month compliance period, they're going to turn off that amplified music? Well, <laughs> actually this is an interesting question because what if they take in all their tables and chairs so they don't have a sidewalk cafe? <laughs> I'm not sure there's any prohibition about having loudspeakers out on the right. sidewalk. Otherwise, I don't, I don't think they're going to go that way. <laughs> sure, they'll just well, turn I it off. I think it's important to control the sound. Personally. Yeah, this is an outright prohibition. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it is. I don't know if you want to institute some kind of reasonable controls, but if you do, you have to help well, us if out. Some, if somebody wanted to pipe some music outside, would they just not come to us and argue that they want that, and then it would come before Maybe us? Maybe on again. a special permit well, basis. Or this no. is just flat out pro this prohibited. Is flat out. I think it's Mixes better if it. they not have it. I don't think they should allow. We're getting into all different kinds of tastes and music that way. I mean, the streets <laughs> are noisy enough as it is, you know. Every day the music died. <laughs> <laughs> well, they well, can go inside. indoors. Stay inside <laughs> if you want. They can, to open they the can have loudspeakers inside the cafe and open the doors and right. turn uh -huh. it up real loud. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then it wouldn't be outside. It'll be an incentive for operable windows on the ground level. Yeah. So that's good. Good. That's right. Okay. Do I have a motion? I move approval with the uh, modifications that Jim Martin mentioned. Okay. And staff and clarifications. And staff clarifications. Okay. Thank you. I second it. So we have a, a motion by Commissioner Germain and um, second by Donaldson to recommend approval with the modifications to the council. On the motion, Commissioner Cardoza. Aye. Commissioner Flores. I'm going to abstain. My company's building a couple of developments here with okay. sidewalk cafes. <laughs> good move. Good. Um, well, good. You'll be subject to these regulations. <laughs> sure they will. Commissioner Germain. Aye. Commissioner Hoff. Aye. Commissioner Jeffrey. Aye. Vice Chair Donaldson. Aye. Chair Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Six eyes, one abstention. <laughs> we will forward this to the council with your recommendation of adoption. Thanks, staff. Uh, <laughs> next item is the study session, uh, which is the Flatiron Project at 3645 San Pablo Avenue. Do you need a few minutes to set up while people run? No. Maru, you ready to go? Okay. This is a proposal for the formerly Jug Liquor site at the southwest corner of uh, Adeline, MacArthur, and uh, San Pablo Avenue. It's a small site, about 4,300 square feet. Can we adjust the focus on oh, that? We're not quite there. I don't think that's you. Do you adjust the focus, Maru? You're supposed to do it automatically, isn't it? For some reason, the overhead focus is way off. We're getting closer. A little bit. A little bit. So they might have much better graphics. So this is the site. Uh, it, it's currently it's vacant. The Jagleger building was demolished uh, about a year ago, and it's about 4,300 square feet parcel. And the proposal is to build a, a 30 foot. <laughs> 30 feet high building, uh, a retail building, and it's about 5,000 square mm -hmm. uh, feet in size. It's, it's primarily a single story building with a portion 
about 2,000 square feet of mezzanine level. There will be three parking spaces. In terms of use, it's being proposed as a retail building. At, the, at this point, they have, uh, they're anticipating a, a bicycle shop to go, but that can change. It is in the CG or the general uh, commercial district where retail is allowed by right, so no use permit would be needed. However, if the change is, uh, uh, if there's a different use for the site, such as bars or health clubs or banks, which are all are allowed in the CG zone, but they would require a use permit at that time. Uh, the building height, 30 feet, is within the 40 feet, the prescribed um, uh, 40 feet uh, height district, and so it would not also need a use permit for the height. Uh, in terms of setbacks, uh, the CG zone does not require any uh, setbacks, and no setbacks are also proposed. In terms of flow area, uh, it is within the 0.7 of FAR uh, district. And the proposed flow area is 1.22, so it is greater than what is uh, allowed in this zone, uh, about 75% more, and would therefore require a general plan amendment. Uh, it should be noted, however, that, uh, that our general plan states that all new development uh, shall be developed at an intensity that, in general, uh, does not exceed uh, the intensities prescribed in the map. So it sort of gives a little bit of a flexibility there. In terms of parking, uh, the proposal triggers about 12 parking uh, space requirement. Uh, they are proposing three, and therefore it would re require parking variance. Staff believes that such a variance can be justified in lieu of the size and the shape of the parcel. In terms of design, um, the building has a flat roof. Has vertical storefront windows, large storefront windows. Uh, there is inverse, inverted uh, building walls at the at that corner, uh, sort of creating a small little plaza. Uh, the walls will be sheathed with lap siding um, material made of uh, fiber reinforced cement, and the storefront uh, windows will be stained uh, will be stained wood. There will be canopies, overhand cam canopies, which would be metal. Uh, staff believes that, you know, the building is well designed, but it doesn't, it's not the most exciting design, uh, particularly for the site, which we feel that is uh, entry to the city uh, at that site. And it's perhaps, it also does not take advantage of the flat iron uh, shape of the site. Uh, so that's where we would leave it. We, we don't have specific suggestions at this point, uh, and uh, I believe the drawings are also at a very preliminary stage. Perhaps Sudish has a little bit more detail in his presentation, uh, but with that, um, I have no further comments. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions? Yes. Uh, this is supposed to be a retail building, I presume. Uh, generally speaking, any retailer needs parking, mm -hmm. and the three parking places look as if they were designed for employees because they require somebody to back into them. And uh, a double volume, a 30-foot high space is pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, was this designed for a specific use in mind? I mean, n normal retailing spaces don't have 30-foot high ceilings. Uh, I just can't quite figure out what the, right. what the intent of this is. My understanding is that they have a bicycle shop in mind, and I don't know what this. Well, maybe I've been to an awful maybe lot. That. I bicycle, and I've been to an awful lot of shops. Right. And I've never seen one with a 30-foot high ceiling inside. Well, this would have a mezzanine in part of it. Right. Part of it, but again, and the rest of it. people, particularly with bicycles, generally bring them in their cars because they leave them and then go on. At least that's what I do, and. Um, Again, you'd have to park on the street. That's correct. That's correct. I think Miro mentioned this will require a parking variance. Uh, the so, three I mean, therefore, it is, it is it economically viable to even have it? Is this a it, redevelopment agency project which it, is subsidized? Uh, or? It, it, it is a redevelopment uh, uh, agency project. I'm not sure about the level of subsidy here. And here's uh, Michelle. <laughs> uh, here I am again. 
Um, yes, it is a redevelopment agency project. The agency is currently the owner of the project. It is, there's no level of subsidy associated at this point. Um, essentially, what's happening now is they're coming to you with their preliminary plan in a study session. And we're going to uh, bring the, this same plan to the city council uh, September 5th for their consideration and to, to discuss the potential subsidy. They're actually working with uh, two potential commercial users. The general height and volume of the, the space um, is because it's a very small site, but it has, it's at a, an important intersection. The agency was seeking a design that was, um, that was, that had a visual impact and took advantage of this, this location, which is sort of lends itself to the, the taller, the taller building. Well, but I don't object to the appearance of the building at all. I just wonder about its viability. It's, it also, uh, retail spaces generally have higher floor to ceiling heights than but residential. Not 30 feet. Yeah, well, it, it, it has, it has a mezzanine in it. In about a quarter of it, yeah. Right, right. So it has sort of a grander uh, entry portion, and then the back portion has a, a I mean, mezzanine. You so could it's get three times the amount of parking in there if you made the ground floor predominantly parking and made the retail on the second floor. I mean, there's a lot of ways that I think it could be a more viable site. It, I mean, if, if you're just selling it to somebody and not subsidizing it, that's something else. But uh, that doesn't appear to be what this is at this point. Generally speaking, ground floor is more valuable right. retail space than second floor space. So the maximization of ground floor space um, has higher value than, than doing second floor space from, from a, an economic viability perspective. Uh, more parking is always desirable, but in an urban infill location, most users that are going into those types of locations understand that smaller urban sites often don't have on-site parking. But this is not in the, what you would call the affluent part of Emeryville. Therefore, it's not, you know, going to attract retailers that are um, going to be generating a lot of revenue, I would think. So as a consequence, it's a, a kind of a marginal project. <laughs> <laughs> Just my opinion. <laughs> I'd love to have a bike shop there. <laughs> Um, but there's there, I don't see any uh, street parking uh, on the plan, but I assume this is pretty much all street parking along uh, Adeline and San Pablo. Is there ample parking there? Adeline looks like it has block parking. It's like they have bulb out for landscaping. I will. Yeah. Maybe we should um. let. Sadish do his presentation. Okay. I think that may answer some of the questions. Michelle, I mean, if you want to elaborate. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, no, Charlie. I, the one thing that I wanted to say was there, there is on-street parking available on San Pablo Avenue yeah, no. um, and, along, yeah, no. and along Adeline at this time. Good evening. My name is Stuart Rickard, and we're very excited about this project. Um, For a lot of reasons, it's a great site. It's got a very interesting shape. It's a triangle. And it's very visible on two very more major streets, uh, San Pablo and Adeline. And there's a lot of traffic there. So a business that, that occupies that building will have a lot of free advertising just from its location. And uh, while that location right now may not be uh, the retail center of, of Emeryville, it's certainly not. Um, part of the reason that it's a redevelopment project is so that it can be a catalyst for development in that area. Um, uh, staff and Sudish and I and other members of the team have spent a lot of time on this project looking at different alternative uh, ways of configuring a building on the site and different alternative uses. And we arrived at this because it balances issues of parking and use and cost uh, in a way that's most successful. The, the most successful uh, uh, alternative that we could find. Um, 
Uh, having a, a retail use there is important for bringing uh, uh, a connection between the street and the occupants of the building um, and to improving that star intersection. And as uh, many of you are aware, uh, Sudish has been working on this, this site and its context and trying to create a, uh, a much more friendly pedestrian environment and uh, bicycle environment at this location. So this building is, uh, is designed with a sense of that context. It's not designed just for that one site, that one property. It's designed to help catalyze uh, and improve that neighborhood. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sudish. Good evening. Sudish Mohindra, STFM Design Studio. Uh, as Stuart said, this is, uh, I've been involved with a master planning this, what, we, what we're calling the star intersection. Essentially, um, it's, uh, it starts from the, uh, let's say, the, the Avalon building on the north end, encompasses Maz Auto, and then crosses MacArthur, uh, uh, MacArthur, and over to the other side with the Golden Gate Keys site, which is, which is this one right there, and of course this site. Uh, and I'm I'm, a, I'm aware right now there's a number of changes happening here. There's obviously a, a, something that you all know. There's a new building that we, we got approval from you all here, a residential building with reach on the ground floor. Uh, there is a discussion about a residential with some reach on the ground floor in this complex. The uh, laundry site here, uh, he, sorry, uh, here, here. Uh, and so one of the, one of the goals of uh, developing a plan for this area is to connect the north side to the south side. And there are pockets of street level pedestrian activity. The Sens restaurant here, there, there are pockets of it already there. So it's, it's, a, it's sort of adding the pieces and making uh, it kind of knit together. And I think from that standpoint, the, it's, we really have to think in terms of a continuous sort of fabric of storefronts. And we did look at, uh, a reference was made earlier about parking. Uh, we did look at uh, alternatives where we could have more parking on the site. Let's say towards the back here, we could drive in one direction and go out the other direction having a smaller retail space here. Uh, the problem, I think, uh, on, on balance with all those schemes is that we then perpetuate what is a, a not a very friendly situation on the street that exists right now because we, by putting parking, we are isolating, again, this building from its neighbors. So what we want to do is connect all of these areas. Uh, and as far as... Um, we did look at in the star intersection, which I will go to this now. Sudish, excuse me. Yes. Can you use the cursor on the computer to point because it doesn't, the laser pointer doesn't show on TV or on these it's screens? It's a mobile phone, a uh, mobile microphone on the right side there. So when we looked at the star intersection, several objectives. One, to make this more pedestrian friendly. And by that I mean something that is not so out of scale that people feel like it's going to take forever to go from one side to the other side. Adding crosswalks that don't exist right now. Add, uh, uh, sort of, so use simple word, greening the area. There's a lot of wasted asphalt space and so providing shade. Uh, and much more definition, and 
developing healthy sort of uh, relationship between pedestrians and automobiles. Now, one other objective has been, which is to uh, have parking in areas that are close to this intersection so that people could come, park there, and then shop uh, nearby. First uh, element of that actually master plan, we've kind of already implemented. I lost my cursor. Um, so, so if you look at this, the, one of the first areas that's just outside this map here, which is on Adline Street uh, about a year ago or so, we've added diagonal parking spaces. That has given a boost to the, uh, the, the retail spaces on, in the Avalon building. The other element that is not implemented yet is the one on the east side. We have a pocket there that could easily accommodate uh, several cars. And the third alternative location, uh, in addition, is uh, parking along Adeline Street, which again, it's, you're not able to see it here, but we are looking at in the master plan to, because the traffic on Adeline is, is uh, volume is less than uh, its current capacity, we're thinking about uh, re or redesigning the street section so that there would be diagonal parking. It's just that it won't be able to happen right at the intersection because the number of turning movements, but it'll happen just south of that, of this area. In addition, uh, in front of the Springs building, there is a area which is very underutilized here, which is where my cursor is, and we're showing some parking pockets there. So that's our, our objectives. Coming back to this building, the, the building occupies the entire footprint. Uh, we've designed it. The, the back in parking uh, idea really came up, came, came up in, in our discussions. Uh, and I think to be fair to this back in uh, parking idea, it really needs to be seen in the context of how Adeline Street is being redesigned. And I think it's not fair to judge it right now. So I, I just want to leave it at that because that's really a, uh, a result of that. The premise essentially being that it's a safer way for, uh, for pedestrians and, and motorists to interact because when, when you are backing in the space, you're in the mode of being in the traffic and you're always watching out for people as opposed to going head in, and then when you're coming out of the building, you just, your eyes are adjusted to your building. You, you don't have, your mind is not oriented towards pedestrians and sidewalks and so on, and you could easily back out uh, onto, onto a pedestrian. So that's the idea, and I think to, to a large extent, that's uh, what we have done is minimized. I'm not sure why I'm is to minimize the frontage that is devoted to parking. So on San Pablo, we have absolutely no frontage that's devoted to parking. And on Adeline, a majority of it is also not devoted to parking. What you're seeing essentially is a, a building that is uh, taller in, in about half the area and has two levels here. The building is not going to be, the, the, the 30 feet is, is sort of approximate to the top of the parapet. I think by the time we have roof and so on, uh, it's not, it's more like 25 foot high space, which is only a little higher than a lot of retailers prefer nowadays. And we think that, that that's, a, that's a good height and scale for this building. The, the, the corner treatment uh, is somewhat unique. And I, before I describe that to you, I want to show you two corners that are very close to actually this intersection. I think one works and one doesn't work. Um, and this is not stylistic at all. This is simply uh, the, the Avalon corner 
just from an uh, urban design standpoint, I think uh, even though it, uh, it is visible from a great distance, when you get there, there, there is really no activity at that corner. And, and on the other hand, uh, this building here, I'm, I don't know the name of it, but it's, on, it's off uh, Adeline. And um, it has a very simple, uh, age-old uh, way of the way corner buildings, uh, I, I think, should be. I'm, I'm, not, uh, uh, I'm not talking about the, the use or, or the style of the building. I'm simply saying it's, a, it's something that welcomes you from a distance. Uh, you can tell there's an entrance right off the corner. So that's the... That's 39th and Adeline, 39th. Losing one of my, okay, there we go. I think I, so the order got shifted somehow, but it's on 39th and, and Adeline. So now turning back to what we have, what we're proposing is, is essentially a building which has a negative corner. It kind of opens, opens up. So it has two corners, creating a, a, a sort of an odd space, you can say, which we hope that is, is, is perfect for this odd-shaped site, in a way, you will be able to come out of, this of the building out here, depending on the use that could be used as sort of casual seating or simply an entrance and perhaps uh, a place for people to go out and uh, as sort of a very small entry. I wouldn't even call this a plaza, but just a vestibule open to the sky uh, area, and that's what you're seeing here. The, the bicycle is that, because we are talking to one of the uses, could be that, but it doesn't have to be obviously a bicycle, but it's a, sort of a symbol of, of what's inside. And, and I think uh, in terms of, the, because the building is, is primarily one story, or one and a half story, it's, but occupies a very prominent location the approach we have taken is a, a very rhythmic building that has a very strong rhythm and strong presence of sort of a disciplined kind of uh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Windows. I'm, I'm going to recuse myself because uh, the property you just showed, the acupressure, uh, my company owns that property or we're about to show. It. And that's within 500 feet of this site. Correct. So oh, Mr. So Flores has a potential conflict of interest here. I didn't realize it until just now, but that's... So uh, in terms of, uh, I think in our design, again, we are focusing more on what the building offers to people as they come close to the building. From a distance, driving by, it will certainly catch people's eye as a very strong rhythm. But when they come close, uh, some other elements will get uh, revealed to them. First of all, we intend all of the, the windows, all of the storefronts, which, by the way, are designed so that they are six feet wide so that the flexibility is there. Any one of these could be an entrance, a double doors. So it's a very flexible building depending on the uses and how many entrances you may want. Oops. And uh, the and they'll be made of um, Maranti wood, which is, a, there's an insert we have, we've recently done a building, it's uh, sustainably harvested hardwood. It, it, it can withstand sort of the tougher environment, uh, the weather and so on, but it'll have a rich sort of wood appearance all around. In addition to that, the, the, all of the openings are going to have an overhang that you see here, which is again is a strong rhythm so every window is going to have an overhang. And uh, our concept there is the overhang will be a perforated material, very much like the two examples I'm showing in, in here. One is a gate at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, and the other is uh, in Southern California, which is an enclosure for an outdoor courtyard for a restaurant. What is interesting about both these cases, and I've, I've observed in both of these places, is that when the sun, when the sun shines in the day, you see the shadows of of, that, of 
those elements cast on the floor. So here we're thinking uh, that that's, these overhangs could be, could be designed by an artist so that as you're walking by on San Pablo, you'll have these shadows. And there's, uh, there's a uh, three, six, nine window, so there'll be nine, of, nine shadows there. I'll, and also at the triangular corner, that there would be, and there could even be a panel, depending on the use of the, um, of, of the building, that could even be customized. So it, it's, um, we want this to be something that's very open to the, to the sidewalk, to the public, hold the edge, uh, but certainly does not uh, try to dominate uh, this, this huge intersection, uh, which I don't think a one or two story building could ever really do. So I'll, I'll stop with that. I'll happy to answer any questions. Well, I think it's a, a, a very handsome building, and I think it does meet your goal of <coughs> establishing a monument on this corner. I just uh, question the economic viability of a retail space in that location and that shape. Uh, Redevelopment Agency has funded some projects on San Pablo uh, west side of San Pablo, north of Park Avenue, where they subsidize the rents for tenants. There is adequate parking there, and yet they still come and go. And that's probably closer to the center of things than this is. Um, and while I, I'd love to see something like this, uh, I don't know if it really makes sense. We have a lot of retail spaces that go into the base of of apartment buildings along San, or condominiums along San Pablo that have a great deal of difficulty renting out. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's a parking issue. It certainly isn't on the ones uh, north of Park Avenue, but at um, any rate, uh, you know, it, it's a piece of sculpture. I think it's very handsome. Uh, the question is, what do you do with it when it's done? So is your suggestion to in try to include residential on top of this small No, I, I just think that, you know, that it, it should be designed around some viable use mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and not just as a piece of sculpture. Because um, it is a handsome building, I think. And I think it's been very nicely done in the corner and the overhangs and color and all of it. Can you? Uh, but I just don't know if it right. Can you works. speak to the... Sure. Um, sure. Future I'll, tenancy I'll, yes. and your well, concerns clear. about financial fee. Obviously, you're not entering into something that isn't supportable, I would trust. Maybe you can speak to that concern. Sure. Uh, well, I, you mentioned uh, retail spaces that haven't done well on San Pablo, and, and I think sometimes the problem there is the use. Uh, if a use is a pedestrian oriented use in an area that doesn't have good pedestrian traffic, it'll suffer. If the use is a destination use on a highly recognizable street in an area where uh, there's maybe a gap in the market for that product, I think it's a different story. And I think there are. Uh, successful businesses on San Pablo, uh, small businesses. Um, so I think it's a matter of finding the right use for the site. And that's not easy. It's been something we've worked on for a long time. But uh, I'm quite confident that we'll be able to overcome that. If I can we add, uh, we'll also share the fact that this is unlike the some of the other projects, the, the goal is that this will be own, owner occupied. So this is not something that you're just renting. Am I, am I correct? Potentially, yes. Uh, uh, obviously, there's, there's a financial uh, deal that needs to be struck with the city council, and that's at a different level. We're here today to talk about use and design, but Art, you had a comment, question? Uh, yeah, I had, I had several comments. I went to look at the site, and uh, in spite of the fact that uh, 
It may be a nice building. I don't think it's an outstanding building. As a matter of fact, the design you have on the site, the picture you have on the site, is a substantially better building than this one with that five-story circular tower. I think that would really make a significant statement in that area, and I'm a little bit disappointed that that was left out even before you negotiated the cost with the redevelopment agency. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the city is thinking of putting in clocks. That would be a great place to put in a clock tower at the entrance of the city, and I think it would substantially improve your design. In terms of use, I believe it's uh, a mistake. Uh, the retail, uh, I'm in the, I'm in the real estate business, so I have some knowledge where I'm not in the design business. Uh, the retail, the, the, the concentration of, of retail ends north of MacArthur and, all, and goes all up. You, you're, you have a gap of almost 100 or 200 feet, and then you're picking up retail again. That's not normally the way you de develop a retail area. It's not contiguous to any other retail use. On the other hand, if you look at the block itself, the block itself is predominantly residential at one end, artists and art, art, artistically oriented use. I think this would be a great place for, for, for uh, lofts, for live workspaces, where I think it would n not only uh, enhance the area, it might solve your financial and parking problems. And, uh, and I, I understand that loft space uh, or, uh, is permissible in a, in a commercial zone, isn't it? This, that would be a permissible use. Uh, live work. It? Live work, would, live work. Be, would be allowed with a conditional use permit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 my own feeling is I think you missed the mark. I'm, I'm sorry to say. You know, if I could point out to the Planning Commission, this is, your role is simply design review for, on the architectural. So, and issues as to use and potential users are not within the authority of this body. So, we really, even though the agency owns the land, the, it is really, you need to treat this developer like any other applicant with regards to design review. And you'd really be overstepping if it were just your average applicant, so. Well, I guess my only comment in that regard then, and speaking as an architect, I, th I think that there should be adequate parking for retail. Um, I'm not bothered by the lack of parking because it is such an odd site, and I think that there is opportunity for a lot of street parking in underused areas now, and that the street parking can be increased, and I, th I also think it's much more important to have a real good street wall that encloses that intersection at least a little bit because it's a big, vast, unfriendly intersection. And for that reason alone, I would, I would encourage that the building be even higher, or do something that will help to scale that sea of asphalt that's there. I'm glad to see that you've got some planting considered in the overall master plan area to try to soften that intersection because it's a Stop. hard, dirty looking place right now. Um, so I would, uh, I would also in, um, agree with Art that there's opportunities here to make more of a statement and make more of an impression when you're uh, coming into Emeryville in this in, at this intersection and I would hope that you'd take more advantage of that location. I would agree with that. I think we need we need an entry gateway statement building there. And I also don't have the concerns about parking. I think that um, as staff had pointed out, you know, it's on a major transit corridor. Um, and we're trying to get people out of their cars. Um, I think the idea of, um, uh, I know we're getting a little bit saturated with lofts in Emeryville, but some sort of a, a residential live work kind of concept would be good. And I would not want to see any parking that's visible, particularly along um, San Pablo Street, to accommodate that. So that's going to be the challenge. If you go residential, how would you accommodate, you know, parking? Um, 
and maybe this is, we've had some previous discussions and we will be having a study session next month on creative approaches to parking and whether we bundle parking or unbundle parking. And I would consider that as you're going through this design process. But taller and uh, definitely an architectural statement is warranted at this intersection. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I do appreciate you're trying to warm up the facades along there with the use of the wood. I think that's a nice thing mm -hmm. because that is a really cold area mm -hmm. visually. I, I think the site is so small that that's the biggest challenge of all. Absolutely. You know, I, I agree a monument would be ideal on this site, but to make it five stories would just aggravate the issues of parking, I would think, <laughs> although it would look handsome. The canopies on San Pablo, are those within the property line? Uh, no. Then you're dealing with Caltrans? Yes. All right. <laughs> Just want yes. to let you know. <laughs> yes. I don't have any problem with uh, the lack of parking. I was just thinking that uh, there'd be a nice, if this is a bicycle shop, there'd be a nice bike shuttle van in there that would pick up <laughs> bicycles. <laughs> Good point. I see. And they get I missed that and meeting. They get a discount if they bring in two right. bikes. They have to appeal it first. Uh, other than, uh, I, I think I'll let the architect speak to the design, and I'll just continue speaking to the sell saleability of it. Where's uh, where'd Carol go? Oh, she's over there. <laughs> We're not <laughs> there. No. We're not supposed to talk about that. Point. <laughs> well, we can it's talk kidding. about it. But <laughs> One other comment, sort of, I, I like the design and, and I like the verticality of it, but if, if we were to go taller, I, I think we would need to look at a different window configuration where we have, you know, broken up with mullions or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to, uh, because with large window expanses, uh, you know, with a, maybe a three or five story building, it, it would be a bit much. Um. I see that, yeah, I mean, this is a really challenging site, and you've tried to address those challenges. I have to agree that I think a parking variance is appropriate for this use, whatever goes in here. I think there are risks and challenges that anybody wishing to occupy this, whether it's a retail condo arrangement or private ownership, um, would have to accept um, the neighborhood, the configuration, the limited location. Um, design review wise, it's kind of interesting how instead of emphasizing the, the flat iron, you've gone the opposite direction. And I'm not sure how functional that door space is going to be in its current dimension. Is your idea that the whole wall would open in? Word I can't, uh, I don't understand that. No, I think there. the idea is that in the plan, if. Uh, Oops. Looks like it slides it, into it. it. There, there, are sli there are two sliding doors in, in this area, in this area, that they would uh, slide. You have to pull it inward as you're standing outside the door? They, oh, no. They right. I mean, these are not meant to be entry doors. The entry doors will be somewhere else, but this is really to be operated by the the uh, tenant during good weather. Oh, and okay. Either they'll go away, okay. disappear. Okay. Up. They could be rolled down. Uh, there's one. The the closest thing I can think of is uh, there's there's a, a store on Gilman and uh, no, seventh or ninth where the where the Smith and Hawk and that whole complex. Yeah. There's a store, ethnic art store that has these two doors that at the at a corner mm -hmm. and. The business generally opens them up mm -hmm. during the day, but you could just close them. There's no mullion okay. there. When they open, it becomes a bigger opening. So it's that sort of fun element, but it's not really meant to be the main entrance walking in no, from the street. Um, I'm just thinking about how p important and prominent that corner is. And uh, I understand Gail's point as well about um, you know, how do you balance height and the challenge of additional parking and the f functional use of such a challenge space? You're dealing with a triangle, um, which presents challenges just for operation. 
it almost I almost feel like your building is um, you know solid enough without doing something fancy at the corner and allowing that right of way to become a public art location, mm -hmm. a very vertical public art location, which becomes the focus rather than the building or the the apex of the triangle, you know, a large vertical standalone sculpture. We saw some interesting sculptures in the competition for the Greenway installation. Um, and if you gave it enough breathing room, that r could really become an interesting focus. Uh, there's a sculpture on the opposite, the west side of Adeline. Um, it's not very visible. It may have been constructed by the current occupant of that spring building. It's kind of, it's, it's a subtle piece, but um, that might be a way to deal with the corner and the, the, the lack of, um, focus that you have in your building right now, your deliberate mm -hmm. reverse of that focus to put something out right in the public right of way there. You obviously have enough space to accomplish that there, especially if you're, if you're providing that landscaping around the perimeter. Um, I'm a little concerned about the awnings, um, especially during winter. Usually your an awning functions to provide some protection. I'm not sure your shadow, the shadow would play on the building, but it would be a very short period where the shadow is going to play on the sidewalk. Um, and a lot of times what happens when you have that type of open awning, it becomes a place where the water actually concentrates and you end up getting dripped on. Um, and people end up uh, trying to avoid that. Um, so whatever you do with those awnings, it has to be designed in a way where it doesn't become a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. um, the the design, the richness of that uh, facade, I'm a little concerned that the material you intend to use there isn't going to work. You're using, you know, the fiberglass lap board, and um, I guess your idea is to paint it really richly. Mm -hmm. is that what yes, <laughs> that is the idea. Okay. Um, I don't know. It's a... You know, I just don't want the whole thing to look cheap and worn uh, out in five years. Right. I, I, I completely share your sentiment. We don't want this to look cheap. I just wanted to add that I didn't mention that the, we do plan to have the base of the building to a certain distance right. uh, so that the even carts and all made a, a base will be a forward in place colored concrete right. so that even if you, were, you had a cart and you just push it against the building, it would not make contact with the cement boards. Right. And interior, the, it hasn't been programmed out at all at this point. You know, it's whatever you can pull in as, a, as an occupant, whether it's one or three or five, your space would be subdivided to accommodate the use that comes in there. Is that correct? Okay. And you've had serious discussion with one interested party in particular with, that wants with, to hang well, a bicycle I think, in front of the I building? Think, I think more than one. Okay. Uh, you want to talk about maybe the other use, potential use? Uh, well, I think the, the space is open for uh, tenant improvements. Uh, and I think it, as a retail space, it's best uh, to have the sales area out towards the corner where it's most visible and where it has that volume of space. And uh -huh. then the services that would serve that retail space would tend to be towards the south end of the site and the solid wall. I guess my point in that regard is um, as whimsical as the bicycle suspended there at that corner is, if there were a public art piece, you know, there's, there's going to be a competition right. and uh, it would look, pr I think, eventually look pr pretty right. cluttered. I don't, I could see that being suspended along one of the street facades, but mm -hmm. to put it at that corner, which is so important, just seems like um, it could be better used, mm -hmm. you know. I, I think you're right. If, yeah. if there's, uh, if it, as signage, is the attraction and the interest at that corner, it needs to be very special signage. Right. 
Right. And if there is something else there, in the right then the way. signage is signage, and it doesn't have to be the attraction getter. Okay. Say anything about maybe other possible retail uses? Well, I think the the building is uh, a is designed to be flexible uh, as much as it can be given its shape. Um, I'm actually, I'd like to respond to some of the uh, other No, questions. you may. And um, one of the things that Charlie and I have been discussing is that with the need for the variance on the site, that when it does come before you for design review, we're going to have to look at what uses are permitted as of right, mm -hmm. and in the context of that variance, there's going to have to be some limitations because not every use would be appropriate given the parking limitation. So certainly that will have to be better defined for you when it comes up for <coughs> actual <coughs> approval, and I'm sh uh, not every use that's permitted by right on San Pablo Avenue would be appropriate for this site. But the, even though retail is a permitted use, and there are other permitted uses here, with a variance, it may be limited to just retail, because the variance might only be for retail and may not be for other uses. Mm. If Is you there follow, any possibility of the redevelopment agency acquiring the next parcel down, so a larger project could go in there that might work. I don't think at this point that uh. that's on the <laughs> on the. Or is the city limit very close there? Um, I don't know where the city limit but is with re it regards to, but this property was acquired with the money mart, and that was the package that was presented to the developer. I see. Yeah. So, Carol, what you're saying is we can speak to the use. <laughs> that's what I. Th yeah, that's what I think you said. I that's think that's what she's within, trying to tell you. Yeah. I, I'm not completely backtracking. I think in terms of you know that this is design review, but in the context of approving that variance, you are going to have to look at at those windows of uses. So if I was too harsh, I apologized. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yes, go forward. So uh, <laughs> we've tried. We've really tried uh, uh, in creating this design to see things from your point of view, and uh, we have spent a long time and, and looked at many, many alternatives for the site to try to come up with this one that we think is optimal. And some of the, the trade-offs that exist are uh, if you go to a, a residential use, uh, presumably at an upper floor, uh, you have to park that. And uh, that takes away, sp or you, maybe you don't even have to park that, but you uh, need to have some sort of service core that goes up, and it takes away from the retail area. And we're of the opinion that in the long term, this area will be a vibrant place that pedestrians go to and that uh, a pioneering uh, retail use that's a destination use can help catalyze that. And um, we found that uh, putting residential above takes away from that future. It, uh, and it's also, it's sort of a small site to do that on because it's only 4,000 square feet. So if you do, you don't get very many units per floor. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a very, very small project. And, it, and it's, it's expensive to do. So we thought the city was getting the most bang for the buck out of this design. If, if I can address, uh, s uh, some of you have mentioned the, the uh, preference for a more of an iconic statement at the corner, and, and you were referring to, I think, uh, one of the drawings that's on the site that we had done many years ago. And I, I think the only thing I want to say to that is that, uh, a, um, it, again, our feeling is, just like you've said, it, it, when you do something like that at a prominent intersection, it has to be done well. Mm -hmm. um, and so in order to do it well, it's it's as it is. This building is 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 a 300 plus 
dollar a square foot building when you talk about, and, and we certainly wouldn't want to downgrade any of the other parts of the building. So now if the building has to financially also carry this iconic element which could add another twenty, thirty dollars a square foot, $150,000 is, is really not a lot of money to have a uh, iconic statement, a tower element, something that's well designed. So I, I, I think that's certainly possible, but uh, this, that's the discussion I think, you know, we perhaps we'll have at the City Council in terms of how much subsidy in the building. And alternatively, some of you have mentioned that it could be that the iconic element is the public art element. Uh, so we're open to all of that. We're not, we're not saying that uh, a strong symbol at the corner isn't desirable because after all, we, we actually had come earlier with that proposal, but what we're saying is really that to do it well, uh, to do it well would, would, would cost, and I don't think we want to do it anything other than do it well. Well, there's 30 feet from the edge of the building to the corner. There's plenty of space yes. there to, in the public right-of-way to right. put a tower up. We could have a real uh, statement there. But, the, you know, I think the building, personally, speaking as an architect, is a handsome building. And I think you've done a nice job within the constraints. I just question right. the economic viability of it. And your sense that Art's suggestion of a live-work option, especially if this goes to condos, where somebody is willing to go in and pioneer in this neighborhood, they'd have a place to live upstairs. They could have a stairway that drops down to the retail or their workshop or whatever and they could still have the parking variance and have three parking spaces or four parking spaces, you don't think that that's financially vi viable? Uh, no, it's not that at all. Uh, we're concerned that uh, live work often is live and curtains mm -hmm. and no real vi vitality at the street. Right. That was that was why we made that decision. Okay. But we, there's a, um, there's no reason that uh, a live workspace couldn't be used for retail, is there? Um, no. I'm just trying to build in as much flexibility as possible. I think, well, we generally refer to that as flex space. It's space yeah. that can be used for just the, about the, anything. The use is there. on Christie Street. Uh, is it called Christie Commons? Yes. Where yeah. you uh, have stores down and an, uh, and a condo above. That's the kind of thing I thought I had in mind where you'd have a lot of, and if you're going to sell them, I think you'd do better financially <laughs> uh, with, with that approach. Uh, the other thing I was thinking is, uh, Getting to Jim's idea, if you stay with this building, what would be wrong with truncating the building rather than having this reverse and making the building just a little shorter by about 10 feet or so and maybe just having a glass panel which would then make that triangular area much more uh, substantial? I thought you weren't an architect. I'm not. <laughs> that. Uh, Everybody likes someone it. told me you may not be able you may, you may not be able to create good design, but you know it when you see it. <laughs> Concerning the question on live work, there is a provision in the zoning ordinance in the live work uh, section that says that in a non-residential district, which this is, any live work building may be converted to wholly non-residential uses which are permitted in that district. So if you had a live work space, it could be used entirely for retail if you wanted to. It's just that retail, it, it, there's more retail space in Emeryville right now than is being used. There's a lot of vacant storefronts and we're just adding more and well, we're not providing any more amenity. Well, someone said that uh, the ideal tenant for this would be an owner user. And that's the whole idea of live work. You're selling the, mm -hmm. the thing to someone who will live and use the space, which is a little different than the other retails that we're developing along San Pablo. But, but almost all the live work space in Emeryville, as someone else said, is just curtains. It will. 
you know, that's what it really is. It's nothing you can look in and see anybody even working in. I thought that Art's idea of truncating the building in the front was an interesting one because it would, um, I believe the San Pablo sidewalk is also all under Caltrans jurisdiction and getting public art on that might be a challenging thing as mm -hmm. well. So having a space that's within the property line where there could be something done, whether it's a piece of art or, a, or whatever. That, that seems like a better possibility at the moment. But that's not, it's something to look into. You could also put a tower just on the front corner there, too. Clock tower. Clock. Well, get Art's clock any, in. Clock. Any other comments? So we, we obviously haven't given consistent direction <laughs> here, but <laughs> no, I, what else is new? I think you've given us good direction. But I just want to make sure I understand uh, with our comments about bringing the building up, making it more of a physical statement. I'm hearing that that's probably not feasible, that you've considered all these different options, and it's something that, I mean, can it be pursued or not? I'd like to understand now whether we come back with a, you know, one story or 30-foot 30, 30 high ceiling building, or we're going to look at multiple stories. Well, could, could we have just, say, a Campanile-like tower at this front corner? Yeah, I mean, I, I just I would mean, like to not, know. Not because usable, but I think it was helpful, since we didn't have that background information with our packet, that th there has been a, a history here, and you've gone through many, many iterations on this challenging site, so that was very helpful. Uh, but I, I do think, at a minimum, we need some sort of a tower, obelisk, whatever, yeah. in the front. It, that's not out of the question okay. by any means. Well, uh, back to the tower thing, since we brought up twice, you know, one thing I cannot stand is something that is fake. Right. You know, we see the quote tower at the Andante building, which is this oh. dead, oh, yeah. useless space. Uh, even the treatment that Kava did on the Adeline building, it's, it doesn't, I don't, I'd rather see nothing and your approach mm -hmm. to do the opposite than to see something that is insincere on that corner and is functionless. So I will be very vocal right. if we end up with something that's just this big fake tower well, because I think we it need to have a tower on a corner. Well, it could have a clock on it. I something. Mean, yeah. yeah. Right. Does, the, does the floor area ratio does that is that restricting your ability to design the taller building because you're already over the floor area ratio? Um, I don't think it is on the residential side because residential, those rules don't apply. Yeah, floor area ratio doesn't apply to residential. Yeah. And also if it's not occupiable space, uh, like a clock tower, for example, that would yeah. not count in the FAR. I think what's, what's, what was really um, stopping us from pursuing that and is, is simply what uh, Stuart said, that this is such a, it's an odd shape, small site. When you start putting residential, uh, the issue of parking comes up. It's one thing to have retail without parking. It's another thing, is the city going to allow residents to sort of find parking at night and then go up? That's one. The other is, when you have residential, you need two stairs coming down, and you have, so you start, uh, all of this starts filling up the space and, and makes it for a very expensive loft, mm -hmm. which is fine if this was Knob Hill, mm -hmm. this triangular site, I think we could make the numbers work because those lofts will sell for million plus with lots of windows. But when we are competing here in the marketplace, the Emeryville of efficiency lofts, this is anything but efficient. I, I would like to go against the majority of my colleagues in, in, in promoting uh, residential. And I, th I think that if you built residential on that site, with, you would need to have parking. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'd sell condos there or even rent without parking. And you would take up so yeah. much of your own, so much of your space. Right. And it would be a fortress. Mm -hmm. It would have to be a fortress for people to live there because of the neighborhood right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm just not in agreement with the majority of the well, I don't, I don't think the shape would accommodate residential yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah, I think Paul makes a good point. 
I think he does. We should probably point out that the same applicant is building a 36 unit residential project right across mm -hmm. the street on that's the opposite true. corner. But it's a shape there that's more suitable to yeah. a house. Yeah. Any other comments before we wrap up this study session item? Well, I don't generally just like to summarize it. I got the sense that with the design that was presented this evening, that we generally like the design, um, including the window treatment, and that um, if it is not going to either work out, you know, financially and just programmatic wise to increase the number of stories, then some type of an iconic artwork clock tower at the uh, the corner there that could provide that height and create that that sense of um, uh, gateway entry I believe is something that the Commission would like to see but I think the design is wonderful I would definitely concur with uh, Buzz's comments I think it's a beautiful design thanks thank you very much good luck with this site thanks. yeah it's a, it's a challenge it's a, it sure is Commissioner's comments. Any comments from commissioners? I think we've made them all. <laughs> I, I would just like to th uh, thank everybody for appointing me to the Planning Commission. <laughs> Welcome, Art. I, I hope you will be able to put up with me. I'll try to behave oh, myself. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to a lot of interesting meetings. Thanks, Art. Welcome. No other comments? The meeting is adjourned. God, we got out of here by now.